Dear Swami, uh, I offer this talk to you and I pray that uh, you come through my words and speak through me and love through me and bring your presence here so we can experience your presence and uh, feel your glory. And uh, brothers and sisters on the spiritual path, uh, it's a blessing uh, uh, and a worry to say a few words about Swami. Uh, and Swami is a, another name for Satya Sai Baba. Uh, a uh, name of respect and of uh, affection, uh, and I'll call Swami Swami. Uh, it's a blessing to be able to say a few words, and I, uh, I know how difficult it is to speak about Swami. I've tried for 21 years, uh, and I, I pray that he actually helps me. Uh, I'm going to give an introductory uh, presentation as if this was an absolutely new audience to uh, Sai Baba, and uh, supplemented with some video uh, over the past year and a half, I uh, took four trips to India and uh, three trips to Holland in uh, helping uh, consult on this film, which is supposed to be an introduction to Swami. And I hope that it uh, shows some of the marvelous aspects of uh, this extraordinary being who has captivated me and uh, many others so much that um, many of us, all we want to do is just say his name and uh, immerse ourselves in his presence. Uh, what kind of force can do that to uh, thinking, uh, relatively sane human beings? That uh, they become immersed in him and all they want to do is say his name and uh, think about him and offer things to him. So I hope I can try to express to you some of the glory that is uh, Satya Sai Baba. Now, um, 21 years ago, uh, I was about nine years uh, into psychiatry and I, uh, I evidently recognized it fairly uh, uh, slowly, but I recognized psychiatry wasn't going to help me understand uh, some of the basic questions. It helps people understand something about uh, anxiety and depression and interpersonal relationships and how to get along socially, but it leaves out an ocean of question about, uh, or answer, about uh, the fundamental questions. Uh, why are we here? In this brief, small period of time, what are we doing walking around this earth, which is part of a solar system, which is a one system among billions in our galaxy, which is one galaxy among billions in all of uh, creation? What are we doing here? Why were we born? Are we just a mistake? And even though we understand these questions, it, uh, they, they leave us quickly. We don't really seem to be committed to trying to find an answer to such an unusual question. What is the purpose of this life? Where are we coming from? Where are we going? Is there some meaning to this besides earning a living and dying uh, with uh, perhaps a few pennies in our pocket or nothing in our pocket? It makes no difference. But psychiatry didn't answer this. I wondered, well, was this a, just a neurotic preoccupation? Thank God uh, somebody of authority, such as Sai Baba, uh, would tell me later that all of these concerns about social uh, existence and about work and about uh, everyday life is a drop compared to the ocean of importance of concerning ourselves with what is the purpose of our life, where did we come from, where are we going. It's not a small concern, it's a great, uh, great concern, uh, yet uh, very little of psychiatry is devoted to it. So I began to wonder, um, is there somebody that could help me understand something about these questions? And I began to ask the question, have you ever seen a miracle? 21 years ago, uh, I wrote uh, a, an in, uh, a um, uh, yoga instructor by the name of Indira, Indra Devi in Takati. I wrote her a letter uh, asking if I could go down uh, to her ranch. She had a retreat in, uh, in uh, Takati and uh, to ask her some questions about uh, yoga and its relationship to Western psychiatry. And she invited me, so Sharon and I went down. We uh, opened the, uh, came in the front door and there was a picture of Sai Baba. But uh, he was standing amongst devotees who were sitting in a devotional pose. And um, I asked her about who Sai Baba, and the whole day was filled with nothing but uh, talk about Sai Baba. And she told me things that were extraordinary, and I couldn't believe. And uh, so, uh, as newcomers, I'm going to repeat just a few things which I grew to recognize are very extraordinary uh, aspects of, uh, of a human being. Uh, Sai Baba would know who you are when you came to him. He would know everything about you. Now, that's sort of unusual. Uh, he um, would know how to uh, cure your illness or uh, tell you about advice about your loved ones and your sick uh, people at home 
or tell you something to help your business. Or he could materialize an object. He could materialize an object that you're thinking. Now, I thought that was quite an unusual thing. I stopped it right there and I says, can he really do miracles? Uh, yes, he does it daily and, uh, and people can see it. Well, what is the significance of that? Uh, to me, it had a great deal of meaning because uh, being in psychiatry so long, I heard many people talk, and I know that talk is cheap. And even the great ones, uh, even the great uh, preachers, uh, you have to wonder what uh, they really do know. Because it's easier to talk and look good than to be good. Uh, you should talk good, be good, and do good, uh, says uh, Sai Baba. But it's evidently it's not such a big power to stand in front of people and convince them about things. It's harder to be a good person. Uh, so uh, uh, Sai Baba says it like this, that many people are heroes on the podium and zeros in life. Uh, and, and I knew that very well, because some of the best teachers were just so verbal and uh, articulate and great, and I could t take a look at their life, and I said, well, that's the way you should be. You're living your life. My God, we're in deep trouble. So I wanted to see a miracle. What did the miracle mean to me? It meant that uh, this person would know something that I didn't know. If I stood in front of you and transformed myself into a bird, it would be unusual. What would I know to do something like that? But the Sai Baba, I heard, could materialize himself into Jesus or Krishna or Shiva, the divine forms, or be two or more places at once, and he could even raise the dead. Now, devotees very too easily sometimes just list a whole list of powers. But where have you ever heard of such a thing? A person that is leading the life of Christ and doing the, the same miracles of Christ, it's an extraordinary thing. He can be two or more places at once. He can visit you in a dream. He can materialize in your home. Uh, pictures in your home can fill with ash. He materializes ash frequently. What kind of a, a level of consciousness or a being or an expression of love can do such a thing? It's really extraordinary. To me, it meant I should listen a little bit, at least look. What is the meaning of such a thing? Indra Devi had a picture of Sai Baba, and uh, it was covered with ash, and she told me that it, the picture was materializing ash. 12,000 miles from him, it was covered with ash. What does it mean? We hear these stories all the time. What does such a thing mean? <laughs> because we so easily just take it for granted. My God, is somebody actually omnipresent and had that kind of extension? And she said, look it, I, I have a film of him, and, I'm, and she pulled out a little projector, and she tried to uh, make it work, and it sputtered, and the a lamp broke and we couldn't see it. Just whetted our appetite. 21 years later, there are two big centers in the uh, area. Uh, there are uh, well-established programs, spiritual, educational, and service programs. We have meetings like this. Uh, people uh, set up the room and they sell uh, nice books and they give uh, uh, food. And we have a projector, I hope, that has a real good lamp to it. I, I hope. <laughs> Uh, 21 years, like a breeze, I can tell you. It's just like a breeze. I don't know if I'll be around in 21 years. Who knows if we're around tomorrow? It just goes like that. What is life? And in that time, thank God, over a year and a half period of time, Sai Baba gave me permission to help uh, express my appreciation and gratitude for what he's showing us in the form of uh, consulting on a film. And I hope that we all enjoy some of these, uh, this film because seeing him... Uh, I, I could tell you that uh, there he is standing in front of a million people. There he is that uh, people from all over the world, politicians, educators, scientists, people of the highest knowledge, they're laying on the ground, kissing his feet, they're standing in front of him, he's sitting there and they're talking about how he's been to their homes, how he's been to their countries, uh, and he's never left India except for one time. Uh, they're telling uh, how he fills their life with meaning, this little man, and I can tell you that and tell you that a million people come to see him, and it's just words. But you're going to see some phenomenal things on this video. Extraordinary. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I can express it well enough. Uh, so, uh, what is the meaning of this, that there is somebody that has this extraordinary ability? I know of nobody else besides in the life of Krishna, of Rama, and of Jesus that have shown this to, to mankind. I know of no, and I knew as soon as I met him that uh, he was a world teacher and he was going to be known extraordinarily far and wide. 
Uh, so what, what was my personal experience? I'll just tell you one or two little uh, experiences on my first trip to India. Uh, Sai Baba was going to present himself in a large stadium, maybe 50 to 100,000 people, just to see him, called Darshan, Darshan to, to visualize a holy one. And um, I was uh, way at the outskirts of Bombay. Bombay is very large. I was uh, invited to a home of a devotee who uh, gave me lunch, and then I was leaving by myself. I'm on the, in a suburb someplace. I'm going to catch a cab and go to the stadium. And as I leave this little apartment building, Sai Baba passes me and goes in the very same building. This is unusual. It's like going to New York and uh, you wanting to see some great figure, Michael Jordan, <laughs> or the president, or some great figure, and uh, you're way in the suburb someplace and you're coming out and he passes you and goes into the door next to yours. I knew then that something was unusual. Uh, even though it hadn't struck my heart, I knew just scientifically that it was a very unusual occurrence. And of course people told me that if you even come to a meeting like this, uh, you think it's your doing, but it's not your doing. This is a, a, a rather uh, sort of a superficial understanding of who we are to believe that we're doing everything uh, and that the major facets of our life are uh, directed by ourselves. Uh, there, there is a deeper meaning. And if we just come to a meeting like this, I'm convinced now that uh, it has to do more about him than about ourselves. Uh, so what is it, um, what is it uh, that brought uh, our first meeting like that? Uh, very soon afterward, I was at a summer school that he was uh, organizing. Uh, there were speakers from all over the world showing great uh, respect. Dr. Bhagavantam, a great nuclear scientist, one of the country's leading uh, scientists and physicists, told me directly on first meeting, Sai Baba picked up a handful of dirt, poured it into his hand, and as he poured it, it turned into the Bhagavad Gita, a holy scripture, a central, uh, a holy book of Hinduism. It turned into the Bhagavad Gita in Dr. Bhagavantam's native tongue. Uh, I then saw many uh, expressions of his uh, materializing, and you will too in the film. He materializes ash, and you'll see that uh, frequently. Uh, and um, one day, I was sitting on the grounds. I heard many people talking about spirituality. I heard him talk about spirituality. Such a simple little lesson as that it's good to be good. It's important to be good. We cannot say that enough in this world where... A few miles from here, there are gang wars and senseless shootings and the most terrible inhumanities to man that you can imagine. Be good. Do good, be good, see good. I thought it was simple, simplistic. I thought, uh, I, I came all the way to India for this. And I remember how I thought that what he was saying was like Victorian, like a throwback to earlier times. I was very far away from him. Uh, this was really the turning point for me. He was surrounded by thousands of people, and with instant he was in front of me, and he smiled, and um, you have to see the presence. His presence is extraordinary. Uh, there's something about his authority, about his evenness, about his, uh, his connection with people, about his extension into the holiest regions. There's something about looking at him, about the way he moves, about the way he talks. And he was in front of me with this extraordinary smile that just lit, lit me up completely. Uh, if you're in front of Sai Baba and he smiles at you, uh, it's not just a smile, it is so full of joy you can't imagine. Uh, you smile from inside here someplace, your heart, you just, uh, I, I felt like molecules, and my body was going to evaporate into molecules. Oh, that sand voice is a hysterical old fogey. <laughs> That's a, people, okay, would believe that. He's an old, just hysterical. I'm telling you, really, uh, I know something about emotional reactions, and really, there's something extraordinary in his presence, a sense of holiness. The hardest people, I've seen the hardest people weep just from looking at him. I'm sitting on the grounds, and I say, my God, uh, the rules uh, that govern the development of one's spiritual life are more real than the rules of physics, than the rules that govern the physical universe. And as I was just thinking this, he came up in front of me from nowhere, and he just stood in bliss for a half a minute, like this, and then he walked away. Well, after my first visit there, all these stories, all these experiences, I was convinced that we are seeing a world teacher 
who has no limitation and extends every place. There's no question in my mind that this world is filled with his presence, that it is more real than the everyday eating and sleeping that we do, that he is here, and that if we turn ourselves, our consciousness, our awareness, we hook it into divinity in some level. Many people uh, feel this with Sai Baba. They, uh, they say his name and they think about him, and they keep him close, uh, uh, keep the lump of coal uh, next to the live ember so it becomes live ember. Keep the focus. And this power that has given us birth and given us consciousness and of which we are all a part, it will come into our hearts and ignite us. Many people feel that as they turn themselves to this extraordinary power, they, e they actually feel his presence in, in their life. And he said, uh, you can do this with any form of divinity. All of them are potent and filled with power and love. And you turn yourself with the real love and uh, real interest in making a relationship, and uh, this love will come into you and you'll, you'll uh, develop a live relationship. Uh, so I was once with Swami. And um, the question is, uh, what is this meaning that he seems to be all places at all times? He seems to know everything. He seems to be all powerful and all loving. What does it mean? And uh, he once told me that um, people believe that uh, they're separate from each other and that the world is made up of separate names and forms. That's imagination. We take it for granted and we live it, our lives that way, but it's imagination. You are not separate from me. You and I are actually the same person. <laughs> Impossible to believe. Maybe we can understand it in the form of our own dreams. We are asleep and we talk to somebody in our dream. We have an uh, actual conversation and they tell us something we've never known. And we wake up and we say, what is that? Uh, was I with that person or was that all my own mind? And likewise, in this waked dream, one day we wake up and we realize we are the totality. We are divinity. That's what he said. He said, look it, I've come to show people that they're not their bodies and their minds who they generally identify with. The limitation, that which is subject to birth and death. This is not who we are. We are the infinite. He said, I, the difference between you and me is that I know this and you don't. Now what a bit of information this is. It's very crucial to, to lead a life, a meaningful, fulfilled life, to understand this. He says, I am every place at all times. I am the most distant star. I'm in the closest blade of grass. I fill all of space as light. I am in everybody's heart. There's not, no place I am not. I always uh, have been and always will be. I can transmute earth into sky and sky into earth. And then he said, I don't do it very often because uh, it's um, inconvenient to some people. Uh, <laughs> we sort of chuckled at that. Uh, and then he said, <clears throat> this is who you are. Uh, you are beyond birth and death. You are beyond pain and limitation. Uh, you are the infinite consciousness. You are divinity itself. You are everlasting life. You are constant, integrated awareness. You are pure love. Now, that's very important to know if that's really true. If that's true, that's important to know. There are a lot of repercussions that come from that. There are a lot of uh, uh, decisions and a lot of um, uh, choices and a lot of attitudes that grow out of such a deep conviction. And how do you get such a conviction? If you're with somebody that can show you that, he can transform himself, he can do all of these things, and he tells you directly, you begin to have some confidence that this is real. This is real, and the understanding of it is just like gold. For us to say it to each other, for us to talk about it, for us to rest our minds in it, it is the greatest gift uh, uh, that we can be getting. When has a divine incarnation come like this that gives us this kind of wisdom, the deepest gift? One has such gratitude to understand what a gift this is. What a gift. It's the center of one's life. It is at the, the center part of all decisions. It is the center of the development of our attitudes and our relationships, to understand this, to contemplate it, and to lead our lives accordingly. And he says uh, to do that, to lead our lives according to this wisdom, to this information, this insight he's giving us, takes nerves, muscles of iron and nerves of steel to have this kind of focus, this kind of conviction, and this kind of confidence. So, in the Hindu tradition, it's said that at a time of darkness, and uh, Warren has, uh, has uh, said this, at a time of darkness and uh, great ignorance and great pain, 
God himself comes to earth to teach us the path to peace and to give us confidence to lead a good life and to try to, and not to try, but to take us out of the muck and mire, to give us some direction. Sai Baba said it like this, for the protection of the virtuous, for the destruction of evildoers, and for the establishment of righteousness on a firm footing, I incarnate from age to age. He said this in 1968. I think it was his 42nd birthday. Whenever disharmony overwhelms the world, the Lord will incarnate in human form to establish the modes of earning peace and to re-educate the human community in the paths of peace. At the present time, strife and discord have robbed peace and unity from the family, the schools, the societies, the religions, the cities, and the states. The arrival of the Lord has been anxiously awaited by saints and sages. Uh, sadhus, spiritual aspirants, have prayed, and I have come. What an extraordinary declaration. Now, uh, this is called this kind of incarnation. Divinity coming to earth to teach and love and cure and help and bring us up. This is called an avatar. An avatar, a world teacher with unlimited capacity to help, unlimited consciousness and unlimited power. This is called an avatar. This extraordinary time in history. Could Sai Baba be a world teacher? Could he affect our slums uh, where there is uh, one killing and destruction and people's minds, and uh, many people's minds have turned to the mind of an animal? I am not an animal, says Sai Baba. <laughs> we, have to, we have to say, I am not an animal, I am man. I am not an animal, I am man. Is there a world teacher? Well, I'll tell you that in India, he's probably, uh, without a doubt, the most widely known and respected uh, Indian holy man. The president, vice president, and the prime minister are his devotees, uh, as are most of the major central ministers of the government. I've been there when the president kisses Swami's feet, and you'll see it on the film. You'll see on the film uh, thousands and thousands. Uh, in fact, a half a million people are gathered at one point here. You'll see uh, this kind of uh, outpouring of interest and how attractive he is. Uh, you'll see um, the president of India. Uh, you'll see Swami coming out, materializing objects, taking letters, people asking him for help. You'll see him uh, in Darshan where he's taking letters. You should know that he asks for no money, he asks uh, that, you not, uh, uh, that you not change your religion. He doesn't ask for you to follow him. And what he's taking when he takes these letters are people's deepest yearning for some kind of contact and to answer some kind of prayer. And so you'll see him taking uh, the letters. Philip Englund, who is the filmmaker of this uh, film, uh, was most interested in Sai Baba because he felt that uh, here was the possibility of a world teacher and that in Sai Baba's service, organization. There are thousands of service groups all around the world now. This may be the clearest example of a selfless service of unconditional love, of the kind of love that's needed to treat the darkness and the people that are in darkness in this world. So that's what interested him in Sai Baba. At the beginning of the film, uh, he uh, sets the stage and he, uh, he, he begins with a scene in which Krishna is talking to Arjuna. He uh, uh, helps people understand from the beginning that the appearance of an avatar is not just a, a chance occurrence that's just happening now, that it's happened many times in Indian history, uh, that uh, 5,000 years ago Krishna came with unlimited power and taught uh, the, the, the lessons of how to lead a good life, and he was teaching uh, Arjuna, one of his greatest devotees. That was the subject matter of the Bhagavad Gita one of India's uh, holiest scriptures. So this film, this film starts with a saying, and now 5,000 years later, a man has come to India who says that he and Krishna are one and the same. And now without further ado, <laughs> we'll show the first part of this film, uh, which shows uh, Sai Baba first with his students. He's got beautiful schools and many beautiful students, uh, uh, some darshan and some talk from prominent people in India. For instance, you'll hear people uh, uh, interviewed. Uh, there is a recently retired Chief Justice of, uh, of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court of India will be uh, interviewed. One of the top five scientists 
um, uh, will be uh, interviewed and many educators. Thousands of years have passed since all this happened. And now, once more in India, there is a man who claims that Krishna and he are one and the same. His name, Satya Sai Baba. Whereas Krishna came down to earth to destroy evil, Satya Sai Baba says he has come to transform evil by love. His followers believe that he, like Krishna before him, is an avatar, an incarnation of God in human form. The name Satya Sai Baba means true divine mother and father. He is revered as a saint who can perform miracles. It is reported, for instance, that he has been seen in two or more places at once, that he cures the sick, even raises people from the dead. Daily, for over 50 years, he has materialized so-called holy ash, which in India is the symbol of inner transformation. Followers who restrict their view to the production out of thin air of necklaces, watches and other pieces of jewelry, he corrects by stating that they are only his calling cards. What you call miracles, he says, is only tinsel and trash. What you should really ask of me is how to reach self-realization. This is the story of a man who was born in 1926 and at age 14 revealed himself as an avatar. For years known by only a few, over the last decades he has become recognized by the masses as a charismatic personality who has set himself the task of reconciling the differences in the world. Whereas his followers have unconditional faith in the supernatural abilities of Satya Sai Baba, skeptics call it deception. Which is the truth? In the end, we chose to follow the simple guideline given by Jesus of Nazareth. By their fruit you shall know the tree. Who is such a Sai Baba, and what kind of mirror does he hold up to our faces? Is he a world teacher who can reconcile differences? How credible is this in a nation plagued by religious discord and stricken with poverty, where decent medical care and getting an education seem to be the sole prerogative of an elite? Our endless capacity for doubt keeps us circling around the question whether or not such a Sai Baba is the embodiment of divine energy. We would have welcomed the opportunity to have him address these issues in person, but he didn't think the time was ripe. Hence, in this film, people who have spent years in his immediate presence come forward. They tell us of their deep-rooted faith, an inner knowledge characteristic of a culture in which the divine takes on many different forms. A culture also in which intellect and feeling are of equal importance in the personal process which is destined to lead to self-realization. We in India believe that God, that is pure consciousness, which is pure, non-dual and indivisible, can manifest itself in human form for the purpose of guiding humanity. And India has witnessed many avatars, what we call, where God descends upon earth in human form. I mean, he's always there. He's eminent in every creature, in every human being, in every creature, in every creation. He is eminent. But he decides by self-will to take birth as a human being in order to guide, inspire men to higher life and it's a matter of conviction that Sai Baba is God, is infinite consciousness descended upon earth in human form to take the people along the path of love and devotion.
to bring peace and harmony. To me, Sai Baba is a divine personality who through the extraordinary powers that he manifests creates an impression that he is more powerful than any human being that one can think of. We refer to him as an avatar of God, which means an incarnation of God Almighty, God descending on earth, but with human attributes, living like everybody else, going through pain and pleasure, suffering from cough and cold, foot injury and so on, but now and then to shake us out of our complacency by performing a feat which is so extraordinary that no law of physics, chemistry, nothing in engineering can just equal the feats that he performs. He produces many objects out of his palm, empty palm, a wristwatch like this one which I am wearing. This is a watch which he gave me about a year ago, one morning, put it on my wrist, I took it out and looked at it. It says made in Paris and it bears a number and so on. So I said, Swami, you got this for me now from Paris? He said, no, I created it for you just now. Miracles are either true or not true. In this case, I have seen them with my own eyes and they are true. I see him as a world teacher because I've, I've seen as a student and as a teacher in Bhagwan's Institute that he's very fond of playing the role of guru. So I always uh, I, I think of him as a world teacher, as a teacher and then of course as a world teacher. But uh, you know, deep inside me is more than just a world teacher, it's just God. Sai Baba has a great relevance not only to India but to the entire humanity because he says that all religions lead to the same destination, the same goal, namely divinity. Each religion prescribes a certain path according to the circumstances and the conditions in which the religion was born. But the basic goal, the basic destination is the same. Therefore, it is not right to say that one religion is better than another. All the religions are of equal validity, equal efficacy, and of equal sanctity. It is that for which millions of people flock to Baba. <laughs> Monday, November 23rd, 1992. Because it is Satya Sai Baba's birthday, approximately 500,000 people have gathered in his native town of Puttaparthi. People from different countries and different cultures. What is it that makes them travel such a long distance from home? Wherein lies the attraction of Satya Sai Baba? Or do we have to interpret this phenomenon as a collective escape into yet another sect? What Bhagwan Baba has come to tell is not that he is establishing a new religion. He is only reiterating what has been said in various religions and down the centuries. And it is his mission to tell us that ultimately you will find that no matter what religion you practice or you are born into, you will find that the same values hold good. And that's why Bhagavan Baba says that when you come to him, he doesn't say that convert yourself into a new religion of Baba. There's no such thing at all. You be, if you're a Christian, you be a better Christian. If you're a Muslim, you be a better Muslim. If you're a Hindu, be a better Hindu. And how do you become better? By constant practice of virtues, like for instance, patience, forbearance, sacrifice, purity. And if you really look, at the basis of all the religions, the overarching value is love about which Bhagwan Baba speaks. Visitors in a museum that is entirely consecrated to the religions of the world. 
Here the Buddhist is reminded of the wheel of cause and effect. The Muslim of the divine admonition that only those who love their neighbors with all their hearts can enter into paradise. The Christian of the birth of Jesus, whose name is mentioned with reverence by Hindus because he is considered an avatar. The Jew of Moses, who received the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. The Zoroastrian of the eternal fire, a symbol of transformation, burning up evil. And the Hindu can listen to the primeval sound of Om, which resonates both in the heart of man and in the heart of the universe. One of the halls at the exhibition is almost completely dedicated to the founder of the museum, Satya Sai Baba. He doesn't want people to worship him because of his name, but he did declare that only those who strive to understand him are welcome here. In complete accordance with the tradition of the Upanishads, ancient Indian scriptures, some of them dating back more than 2,500 years, people in the temple square of the ashram in Puttaparthi are waiting for darshan. Among those who wait are not only Indians, but people from many different countries and cultures. Darshan, which literally means breathing the same air, is an occurrence during which Satya Sai Baba, in line with ancient custom, shows himself to his followers. Patience is regarded to be a divine virtue in India and must be practiced by everyone. That holds true also for the president of the nation, who we see here with his following, paying his respects to Satya Sai Baba and waiting to be received. There are a large number of leaders of India who flock to him in complete dedication. And that is bound to have its effect ultimately on the destiny of the country. And more than anything else, I must tell you one thing. I have been with Swami, with Satya Sai Baba in his car, or walking along with him in Puttaparthi. And I have seen multitudes of people looking at him, pray, praying to him, with such devotion in their eyes that I have felt very often so humbled that, well, my devotion is not a fraction of the devotion which these poor ignorant people have in this Divine Personality. The Bhagavad Gita starts out with the doubts and despondency of Arjuna. He refuses to take on the battle to which he has been called. Krishna teaches him that divine love resides in the heart of each and every human being and that this love is all-embracing and excludes nothing. In the end, when Arjuna asks Krishna to show him his true form, through utter grace a unique darshan falls to him and he bows down to his teacher in total surrender. Ever since he was 14, Satya Sai Baba has been granting darshan to devotees. We wondered what people hope to experience here and couldn't help but think of the words of the Swiss psychiatrist Carl Gustav Jung, who once said that the questions who am I and what is the purpose of my life are closely related to a fundamental religious and psychological problem. The answer to those questions presupposes a profound inner search in the course of which one shouldn't be tempted to extremes. By staying balanced and detached, one can then ultimately reach a stage of conscious self-reliance. This was also the task of Arjuna. Standing between the armies of good and evil, he learned from Krishna that there is no evil from which something good cannot spring forth, and no good which cannot lead to something bad. Approximately 50 miles south of Anantapur, in a broad valley, we find the town of Puttaparthi, the birthplace of Satya Sai Baba. Surrounded by two mountain ranges, this primitive country village changed over the last decades into a roofless cloister, 
the ashram Prashanti Nilayam, the abode of the highest peace, where millions of people gather every year, hoping to meet Satya Sai Baba in person. In the immediate proximity of the ashram, an elementary school and a high school were built, and a men's campus of Sai Baba's university has been founded. The educational system of Satya Sai Baba seems to be popular, because the university, with its 1,200 students, already has a waiting list. There is a third college at Brindavan, near the city of Bangalore, which houses approximately a thousand students. All the students are interns. They are allowed to visit home each year. They meet in lecture halls, on the sports fields, in the village, in the ashram and in the dining halls. Both the college for women in Anantapur and the two colleges for men are autonomous and recognized by the Indian government. As far as science is concerned, we are mainly concerned with secular knowledge. Whereas here we are concerned with spiritual knowledge. Now, secular knowledge means you're dealing with the physical universe. Here you're dealing with the universes that lie above the physical universe. Here you look outwards, as far as science is concerned. But when you are on a spiritual journey, you look inwards. So here you look essentially through your physical eye, whereas here you look through your inner eye. Here seeing is believing, but here experiencing is believing. And that's very, very important. <clears throat> and here, the knowledge has not been fully obtained. We are still accumulating knowledge. That's why scientific research is in full swing. But as far as this is concerned, we believe that whatever is that we know has already been revealed. It's just that we have to absorb it, internalize it, and make it a part of a system in the quest for our, our roots, spiritual roots. One interesting thing here is that in the quest for science, ego grows, you know, you become proud, arrogant. Whereas in the quest for our spiritual roots, we have to dissolve our ego. Another very important difference is that when we look at the physical world, we see diversity. Whereas when we turn the eye inwards, diversity gets merged into one cosmic unified manifold. And as far as scientists are concerned, they travel only halfway. They don't realize that there is a second half. You saw Swami with, uh, during his birthday with a half a million people there. And um, uh, so many uh, wonderful people talking about the meaning of uh, Swami as an avatar, as a will teacher. Isn't it something to, to notice that? You see, there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people that come to see him every year. And uh, he opens the doors and people come. Uh, his service workers attend to the ashram so that it's uh, handled, uh, it's cl cleaned, and it's organized and structured. Uh, and they allow for the presentation of all kinds of programs, including um, conferences and uh, celebrations uh, and um, uh, meetings and educational meetings, uh, hundreds of thousands of people. It may cost you, if you're, if you're extravagant, 50 cents a day there. And yet uh, it's done with this kind of orderliness. What a program is that? Just like a, well, here we have just a few people, uh, no money, and it's a little orderly also. It takes uh, energy and time and a tremendous amount of service people to tend a household to uh, make it so that people can come and, and feel that, they're, that it's warm and that it's orderly. That's a, a very important keynote aspect of Swami's uh, programs, of Swami's ashram. Discipline, very, very important. Being good, being disciplined, <laughs> being focused. Uh, in fact, he frequently says that the miracles are, are to uh, attract and frequently are, uh, should be considered tinsel and trash. Although I can never quite uh, accept that. Uh, I, I find, find that they're really extraordinary. But uh, he says that he comes to attract you in many different ways. Uh, you may have illness, you may uh, 
I have uh, financial problems. You may have spiritual questions. Uh, and then uh, he uh, gives you what uh, he would like you to uh, receive, what, uh, which is important. And that is uh, the teachings. He gives us an insight that man has this great capacity to love and to be good, and in fact that man is divine himself. And so one then would ask, well, what is the path? That's very central, and this lady brings up that, uh, that uh, issue. What is the path? Uh, I'm going to give it rather quickly in a nutshell. Uh, and that is... Uh, that uh, first of all to understand Swami is asking nothing of uh, anybody. He's not asking for money. He's not asking for a new religion. He's not asking that you follow him. He asks that you be good. And uh, to remember, he once asked me, am I a man? I said, I think so, Swami. He said, that's only half the truth. I am not animal. I am man. I am not animal. Uh, and he uh, says this with great intensity, that a man must overcome the selfishness that is, lust, anger, greed, a jealousy, uh, attachment, ego. We must give up the hatreds and the selfishness and uh, reach for high uh, ideals and for high behavior. The truth, to live by truth and honesty, to do good actions, to be at peace, uh, to be loving and to be nonviolent, to not violate anyone, to not hurt anyone. To offer this to uh, everybody as a form of love and service to all mankind and to go beyond the differences and see in all people divinity, that this should be the way that one relates to divinity. Offer your best in the high values, offer it and look for divinity in everyone. This uh, teaching, uh, and, and to give up uh, all interest in the consequences of your acts, leave it up to God. This is actually a central teaching in almost all the religions that I know. To be good, to offer this as the central part of your devotional uh, behavior, your devotional activity with God. And if you look for God every place and everyone at all times, He'll come to you, and that's the beginning of this extraordinary relationship between you and God, lived out by being good with our fellow man and uplifting society. This is central to Swami's teachings. He said not only should we understand the teaching, should we think about God? Should we talk about God? Should we understand the philosophy? Should we understand the teaching? We must put it in practice. And that brings us to the next segment. There are three major aspects to Sai Baba's program. One is spiritual. Uh, and you can see that uh, he has built a large uh, ashram, not at his wanting, his devotees have, uh, where uh, many programs are given. And uh, millions of people have come for spiritual uplift. Another is uh, educational program. Educational program uh, is, uh, it takes a, a, a number of different forms. The one we're going to see is uh, his university system in India. The question is, how can you take these spiritual uh, values, these spiritual teaching, and make it the foundation and the basis of an educational system and a highly respected university system? We're going to see three campuses. Uh, which make up the uh, university system called the Satya Sai Baba Institute of Higher Learning. Satya Sai Baba Institute of Higher Learning. Now respected by uh, the major leaders in India. In fact, uh, in one segment here, the uh, president of India is talking about the greatness of Sai Baba's educational program. How do you put into buildings and teachers and programs and curriculum a program based upon high spiritual truth and make it the center of a non-denominational uh, university program which teaches at the basis how to be a good person and all other uh, information is secondary. If the other information is not based upon high values, it is useless. In fact, he says, politics without principles, commerce without morality, science without humanity, and education without character. Education not built upon character is not only useless, but very, very dangerous. We're going to see here his three campuses. The film crew that saw this, that, that were filming this aspect of Swami's educational program, said these young students, they look too sweet. Uh, people don't generally look this sweet. Are they just living a kind of a fantasy life? When you walk on the campus, you don't fear for your life. People say hello. They smile. They are of service to you. When we sat down for lunch, the students came and served us. 
Sweet, sweet, sweet. Is it fake? And are they repressing their animal instinct, which is important to give vent to? Is it important to uh, rob and steal and shoot? Or to perfect this sweetness? <laughs> is this a fakey sweetness? Well, you'll hear his students and you'll hear his faculty and you'll see the buildings and the programs that make up this extraordinary centerpiece educational program, which should be an example for educational programs all over the world. I believe that's exactly the reason he's developed this, as an example that an education built upon high principles and values and morals is a very vital and powerful uh, educational system. I, I find it quite remarkable that there's a whole university community uh, based upon Sai Baba's teachings that is substantial and um, is uh, so well recognized and uh, so outstanding in India. Now, we're going to call this, we're going to bring this to a close. I actually had two more segments, and maybe uh, another time we'll have another meeting, and I'll show you the other segments. One uh, showed something about Sai Baba's uh, uh, beautiful, high-tech, uh, multi-specialty um, new hospital, uh, which um, uh, is already well-respected in India. It's an extraordinary hospital. And... Um, the uh, president talking about Sai Baba's educational program and to see some of the scientific laboratories at the university uh, and uh, the computer center at the university. It really is quite impressive. Uh, perhaps we can take one or two um, questions and then we'll, uh, we'll bring this to a close. Yes? The third is his uh, service activities. And there are thousands of service uh, organizations all over the world. In India, for Swami's uh, 60th birthday, his service organizations adopted 6,000 poor villages, providing comprehensive medical and social service and educational um, uh, functions to, to uh, the whole village. That's 6,000 villages. And um, in our centers here, uh, we do a lot of feeding for the poor uh, and uh, other kinds of service uh, projects. So uh, spiritual education and service are the three wings of his organization. Uh, is Sai Baba uh, a world teacher? And um, is Sai Baba every place at all times? Uh, what we see here uh, is more than, say, um, some kind of uh, gossip about uh, somebody supposed to be a holy person who is uh, living in midtown Manhattan and has maybe three people around him. We're seeing actually a world event going on here. Is he actually a world teacher who has the capacity to uh, have some meaning in your life. He's not asking you to follow him. Uh, he's here to give us confidence that if we turn ourselves to this glorious spiritual dimension at such a dark time, this is the most potent time to do it. If we're born during such a dark time, when we're born, as we're born, in such a dark time, he says it's the most potent time, but you just have to beware that you have to turn your consciousness to God. This is a time when there's so much distraction that it's difficult to do it. But if we do it in any name or form, in any tradition, he's not asking you to follow him. He says that there will be powerful chance for transformation. And many, many millions, I've heard uh, a low estimate of 30 million, uh, are already considering him a divine person. They turn to him, and there are thousands and thousands of stories of his actually coming into one's life. Direct yourself to this uh, dimension. If it's to Sai Baba, my experience is that he is a living force day by day, minute by minute, in a million different ways. And uh, he's here to give you co confidence that in your own tradition, just attend more intensely and with a more open heart and more pure and more full-hearted. And uh, Swami promises that God will come into one's life. Thanks for being such a nice uh, audience in Sai Ram. <laughs>